So I'm going to talk very briefly about why WSRU is your best possible solution for everything you want to do. Um, of course. So why WSRU for digital transformation? So I'll, I'll just uh, I'll talk you through a few uh, few different aspects of uh, why WSRU provides a, a good offering for people to uh, do digital transformation. So the first thing is, of course, technology. We are a technology company. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is the right technology for companies to do digital transformation. And in our current best belief of how one should organize to do that, there are five core areas that have to be done. And we have offerings in all of them. So first, of course, is API management. Digital interactions, digital integrations, everything comes out through APIs. That's the fundamental bread and butter of, of uh, digital transformation, digital operations. But in order to offer APIs, you need some level of integration because almost everybody has a bunch of stuff running around already. So you need to put that together, package them, offer them as APIs, be able to offer new capabilities quickly, et cetera. And I, as I said at the beginning, identity and access management, you really can't, you really shouldn't do much with the digital transformation without full security taken into consideration. So identity and access management is very, very key. And just as much as analytics, uh, sorry, identity is key, as is analytics. One of the rules that one should follow with doing any digital activity is record everything. Uh, don't give up on anything. One of the main reasons why Google and Amazon and Microsoft and so forth are leading the world of AI today is because they have so much of data. So YouTube and, and the photos, everything. So you can, if you have enough compute power, you can make it learn stuff now because you have a bazillion amount of data available. So same thing applies to every organization. There's a lot of data that should never be lost. Maybe it is Wi-Fi access point usage. Maybe it is the person walking into the building. Maybe it is how many emails are sent. Everything should be recorded, right? And it's a business. So you know, we've signed our life away when you become an employee of whatever the business it is anyway. So there's really no question of privacy within the business between the employee and the business. So this question does not arise there. Uh, but recording it gives ability to detect, monitor, analyze, monetize, create new offerings, learn from that, and make it available for people to do all kinds of things. It's very, very important. And of course, IoT is the last thing. So IoT for us is actually kind of a solution built on top of the other ones. IoT uses integration, uses API management, uses identity access management, uses analytics. IoT is very much a, a long-term play yet. There's obviously connected devices are everywhere, and they're not going to go away. But we're still all trying to figure out how does IoT really play into the enterprise. And that's something that we will, we will figure out as we go along. And, and so WSU's IoT offering is a platform that enables you to connect any device and make it into part of the enterprise. So I have one slide on each one. I'll just very briefly go through them. But I won't really go through them in detail. Uh, but I'll try to answer some of the roadmap kind of questions that were asked earlier. Uh, so API management, as I said, is, is a very, very fundamental thing. We have a product that's been out for almost five years now. We also have a publicly hosted version of, of API management as an API cloud. So I didn't really talk much about this, but every product we have, we are now offering as a SaaS service as well. Uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. An analytics is not, still not offered by itself. It is offered as part of the other ones, but it will be at some point. And the objective is to say, look, if you are running a small a uh, small level of uh, functionality, or if you want to do public-facing APIs, cloud is much easier to do than setting up servers, running it, managing them, securing them, updating, all of that stuff that you have to do with operating software. A cloud, just you just sign up and use, and that's it, and it works. A, uh, the API manager is going through a major new revision right now. We're working on version 3. Version 3 is based on something called Ballerina, which I'm going to talk about towards the end. Uh, a, and our primary objective with, with the API management is make it a far more decentralized kind of API management than what our current architecture offers. So the current product, uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, works perfectly fine. It's very competitive. It's on the same set of feature level as pretty much anybody else. But it's a very centralized architecture. It assumes that APIs are deployed into this one place, and there's gateways that are tightly coupled to that and so forth. The new one completely inverts that architecture. It's very much a container focused, much more lightweight, much more decentralized, meant to be deployed in geographic partitioned architectures. All kinds of very flexible scenarios are supported by that. And that we are targeting to get out in, in uh, Q3, towards the end of Q3 this year. 
So integration again uh, is powered by the ESB that we had for a very long time. We've packaged it into something called the enterprise integrator, which is the ESB and message broker and data services and all of those integration technologies in one holistic entity. Uh, just because we see most customers end up touching a bunch of those. So it's easier to communicate and understand as this is one offering, has a bunch of capabilities and use the right capabilities that you want basically. Uh, integration cloud is a hosted version of the same stuff. Uh, running actually running completely on a containerized environment. So if you want to, if you use the integration cloud, if you host uh, ESP integration there, it's running its own container uh, and running on a Kubernetes cloud uh, on uh, AWS right now. Identity and access management. The identity server is a very comprehensive identity management product. Uh, it handles uh, complex uh, single sign-on, federation, provisioning kind of scenarios. A, the cloud version is still uh, entry level. We, we only have a SSO functionality management and an app portal. So, so you can, if you have 10 apps and you want to have single sign on and have a portal, that's what the cloud version offers. Uh, within the next about three months, we'll have all the functionality matched into the cloud version. And the primary reason for that is the, the product as it was designed originally was not really designed with the intent of, um, let's say, less technical people configuring the product through a web user experience which is what you need to have if it's cloud because there is no other experience. You only have APIs and, and the web experience. So we're kind of re-evaluating re and redesigning that experience to be much more something, much more at a level that people can, who are not deep experts in identity management can get in and configure two-factor authorization, authentication or whatever they want to set up in a, a convenient format. That's why it's taking a little bit of time. Uh, analytics I mentioned, so our focus in analytics is on the real-time aspects. So it, it, uh, most analytics technologies that are used widely today are all open source. It might be Hadoop, it might be Spark, it might be Spark Streaming, it might be Storm, and so forth. So we, we created a, a real-time uh, engine called Siddhi some time ago, which is a very high-performance complex event processing engine. Its strength is in taking multiple streams of data coming in very high speed uh, from different different sources and doing temporal queries across them. So saying within the last five minutes, if you see an event on this stream and another one on this stream and they have these conditions, then trigger something. Right? So that kind of stuff is really, really good at and extremely fast. It does about 300,000 events per second uh, on a single machine. Uh, and so it's really capable of handling a fairly large amount of data and aggregating it and creating uh, insights out of that. Uh, and we've built a whole series of solutions on top of that to make it easy for people who are doing various analytics scenarios. Some of the things that Seshi talked about in the morning are coming from the analytics world. Uh, we, of course, also support what's called the full Lambda architecture in analytics, which is when you have real-time analysis, batch analysis, predictive, and, and so forth, all into one single integrated architecture. So we integrate closely with uh, Spark for batch analytics and Spark ML uh, for machine learning. And if you use Spark ML for doing any uh, machine learning to generate a model, that model come, can go back into the real-time engine uh, so you can make real-time decisions using the machine learned uh, decision function. Uh, IoT, I mentioned briefly, so we also run it as a public offering, this device cloud. Uh, the, uh, currently it is offering Android and iOS level device management. Uh, the, the, the software itself can handle any kind of device type, so we're again refactoring it in the cloud. We can't allow people to upload code to add whatever their device type. There has to be a slightly different model. So we're working on that. As soon as that's done, it'll be completely the same level of parity. Uh, so you can, if you have an Android phone, an iOS phone, you can register the phone with that and it'll track the phone and monitor it. And, and there's a bunch of uh, features coming out which are not released yet in, in this, in the hosted version, like geofencing. So you can say, uh, if this device leaves this area, send an alert. Right, so, so it's great for vehicle monitoring and all kinds of scenarios. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, sort of future technical direction and what we're doing. Uh, so these five products are things that we've been working on for, qu for quite a while. The foundation technologies are WSO2. Uh, we, uh, just as much as we work on doing iterative improvement, right, we also do this thinking long business, right? So we try to figure out What's the way, if you were going to you know, rethink how prob complex problems are done, how do you make problems an order of magnitude easier to solve than they are right now? Uh, and a, so our integration architecture was built on essentially a data flow kind of model, uh, as is pretty much all the other ESP-like integration systems that are out there. And we wanted to kind of revisit that 
in a much more uh, sort of a completely different way. In fact, the inspiration for creating this language came from watching the London 2012 Olympics opening. Uh, if you remember that, uh, you know, during that opening, there were all kinds of things happening in parallel, different people, somebody jumps off an airplane, there was a building that comes up, it gets taken down, there's a fire, someone drives in in a car, all kinds of stuff happening. And if you think about that, imagine writing that program in Java, or in WS3, ESB, or Mule, or IBM, it doesn't matter, right? A, you'd never get it to work. B, uh, you know, it'd be incredibly complicated. But yet, people who are not programmer type people choreograph that perfectly. And it works perfectly well. And so the model they follow is not the standard programming constructs that we are used to from the programming, like, programming methodology we've had for many, many years. But yet, there is one construct that people use for describing complex interactions, which is sequence diagrams. And if you look at how plays and so forth are written out, they're very much like sequence diagrams. There's, there's in, independent actors participating. And they coordinate on various signals that happen across them. Uh, so that's basically what Ballerina is. It's a brand new programming language. Uh, it doesn't work like any normal programming language. Uh, uh, but it's a full programming language. You can write Hello World to write a compiler to whatever. But uh, it, it's, it, its power is that it models the world in terms of sequence diagrams. So you think in terms of there are parallel workers. And you write logic saying this guy does the following. And every once in a while, they might coordinate. I mean, send a message from one worker to another worker. And, uh, and it's inherently parallel. It, the other beauty is it has both a full textual syntax that looks like normal Java C-like syntax, you know, curly braces and sort of standard programming language syntax, as well as a complete graphical representation, which is a canonical representation. So it's not a picture drawing tool. It's not a workflow like, you know, you can draw pictures. But you program, but you program it graphically. And I, I don't know how many of you have, uh, there was a system called LabVIEW, which was a, a long, uh, you know, been there since uh, 19, uh, I used it in 1990. So, uh, you know, it's been there for quite a while. Uh, that was really good at doing all kinds of graphical programs, but ni nightmare messy when you did something complicated. Uh, uh, this, so I, I personally believe this approach that we have taken completely uh, makes it scalable to do graphical programming because of sequence diagrams. A sequence diagram scale perfectly fine for dealing with complicated things. If you have 100 collaborating people, you're going to have 100 vertical lines. Uh, you know, most normal scenarios don't have 100 collaborating people. But if you had that Olympics opening, you would have 100 club, actually. In that case, you'd have 1,000 collaborating people, maybe 100 teams collaborating. And, and we've really uh, rethought how you think about any kind of programming. And, and then, so focus is on integration, but it's a normal programming language. It is meant to run with any kind of problem, but it's optimized for integration. So we've done some things to make things like remote endpoints become natural within that. So we treat a remote endpoint, such as if I'm using a Salesforce API or a SAP system or a database, making that into another kind of actor. So I model it. We've come up with ways of modeling that within the language. And then uh, you can just program with it. And the other uh, unusual thing is, in every program you have written, uh, any, any web kind of thing or a mobile backend or anything like that, most of the time is spent dealing with the data type, data type system mismatches between SQL, Java, whatever programming language you use, XML, JSON, and, and so forth. And that's because the, the type systems were independently designed. The SQL has a data, uh, type system, Java has a type system, JSON has a type system, XML has a type system. So in Ballerina, we've done a completely different model. There is one type system we've designed for the language, which has been very carefully designed to fit perfectly with JSON, fit perfectly with SQL, fit perfectly with XML, and, and MIME. That's the kind of data space that you always operate within. So that impedance mismatch, writing all that ORM layer stuff, you know, Java has 15 different ORM tools. There's data binding. Those concepts don't exist in this world now, because those are inherently taken out by design instead of left for somebody else to fill in. Right. Same, same thing with network protocols. Design very carefully with, uh, with network uh, interaction as part of the core uh, part of the platform. <coughs> uh, a, a very a radically internationalized as well. So most modern programming languages use Unicode. And so you can print things in any language. And also in languages like Java and, and pretty much anything that came out in the last 10 years or so. Uh, identifiers can be in Unicode, so you can use any language's identifiers. A uh, ballerina, we're actually doing some funky thing of allowing 
even the language itself to be written in whatever language you want. Right? So there, there's no, if you're, if you're somebody in Thailand writing a program in, in, for, for a problem that you are solving in Thailand, there is no real value by saying class and for and while and if. Because those words make sense if you are an English speaking person, English thinking person. If you're not, it's just some sequence of tokens, sequence of characters. FOR means, oh, I guess if I put these funky shaped characters, it means iterate. Right? Uh, so Baron is doing some, uh, we, this is an experiment. We'll see how that works out. So there's going to be a language pack concept into which you can basically plug in a language pack that totally uh, changes the language of the, uh, the, the, uh, the user experience language of Barina. Underneath, there's one underlying abstract model that it's operating against. So there's no change whatsoever. You can flip a switch and say, show the code to me in English. Right? Obviously, it's not going to change the strings, because if you wrote a string in Sinhalese or Tamil or Hindi or whatever, it will be in those characters. But all the, the parts that it can flip because it's just a syntax tree, we can change that. Um, so this is something we've been working on uh, a, 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 for a long time, but 100% committed to working on this since about August last year. We announced a version of it in February. Uh, the version 0.87 went out last week. There's another version going out end of next week. And so we expect about three more versions to keep going out. And after that, we are mostly, mostly there. Uh, if you're interested in playing around with it, please try it and give us some feedback. And it's, it's something that, I'm, so this is my, my, my thing. I spend most of my time working on this now. Uh, I'm sure you can tell. I, I, I'm very, uh, very passionate about the implications of Ballerina in terms of making it so much easier to write a bunch of things that we waste so much of time on right now. Uh, and the objective is not for like two times faster or whatever. Even speed-wise, this thing is doing five to 20 times faster than the current ESP right now. Right? So we're not done yet. So it'll slow down when you put all the junk we had to do to make it work for real. Uh, so, but it's still much faster. Productivity-wise, it's so much cleaner to think in this model. Uh, obviously, it's slightly biased. Uh, but uh, the objective is to, so what kind of problems? So this is actually a programming language. And it design, it's designed to boot up and run in a fraction of a second. It's meant to be used primarily for writing microservices, but not like any microservices. It's microservices that do integration for the most part. Right? So, so for example, if I'm writing a program, a service, that is doing lots and lots of business logic, just hardcore Java stuff, or whatever language you use, C Sharp, doesn't matter, Python, then Valorant really won't make it much easier. But if your program is talking a lot to multiple databases, talking to web APIs, et cetera, and that's a microservice, then Ballerina will be infinitely easier to program that in than Java is. Right? And if that doesn't make the program to at least a order of magnitude easier to write, we would have failed, in my view. So this is a pretty radical way of thinking about the problem. And the way it's affecting the WC2 products, this is, by the way, an open source project. There's a separate website. We are running the project. We are writing all the code, but it's completely open source. Uh, there are some patents we are filing for this, but the code is open source. Anybody can do whatever they want with it. Uh, the intent is this will, uh, we want to make this into a language that anybody who wants to do whatever they want uses it for. Uh, we are going to be packaging into the product. API Manager version 3, the API Manager version 3's gateway is written completely in Ballerina. So it's being written right now uh, using the Ballerina latest versions every day, basically. Um, and then uh, the integration product, uh, the ESB core will eventually get replaced by Ballerina. Right? So ESB core, which is a data flow based kind of model uh, with an XML configuration inherently aware of XML and so forth, will move to this over a period of time. Uh, we, because it's, it's our most widely used product and so forth, we're not going to end of life it or stop it or anything like that. It's going to go on for at least another five years with its own sort of evolution. But the, the, the way we think about the right way to write micro integrations and so forth uh, is going to be uh, focused on Ballerina, not using uh, ESP-like model. Right? And, and then um, Identity Server also has a lot of things that they want to do. So they, one of the things with Identity Server is when, when you go to the Identity Admin, they need to write the flow saying, OK, if the person's coming from this kind of a network, then do one level of authentication. If they're coming from an outside network, do two levels. And that kind of configuration Ballerina is actually quite suitable for, where there's redirections involved and so forth. It's much easier to write with this kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that uh, plays out. So timing-wise, we are expecting to get this to a, uh, 
uh, uh, production level in, in the third quarter, so in the late summer, basically, uh, and then keep evolving it. This is going to take. This is a long-term project. It's not something that's going to be finished in one year. You know, Java is not. I, I, I first uh, did stuff with Java in 1993, if I remember right. So we're now 50, 25 years later, right? So, uh, so programming language and Java is still evolving. So there, programming languages are not things that come out and they're done. They evolve for a very long time. So I expect the same thing will happen if you are successful with this. We'll keep evolving it and, and moving it forward. All right. Um, so coming back to sort of the whole picture, why WC2 for digital transformation? Uh, one of the key things is, is really that, so there are many vendors, right? So you guys are all familiar with all the software companies around. Uh, everybody's got perfectly fine solutions for particular problems. We are the only one, believe it or not, we are the only one who has a completely integrated platform designed for that whole problem as an integrated platform. I, IBM Oracle, Microsoft, uh, IBM Oracle primarily obviously have a lot of stuff, tons of acquisitions. Uh, same with Red Hat, like right? tons of acquisitions. Great point products, but as a platform, uh, pretty complicated and messy. So uh, my personal view is, is uh, as a, when you're doing a transformation effort, you, are, you need to not hit walls every once in a while when you try to add some more technology. Hasanka mentioned this approach of sort of incrementally adopting technology, incrementally uh, scoping out a problem instead of trying to do this big, big bang solution. In that case, you have to make sure that when you need a little bit more stuff, you can pick it up without having to hit a wall and jump over it. And that's why this sort of pre-integrated architecture is very, very important. Uh, also open source, uh, that's very useful in many ways. One is uh, it allows people who, who uh, are wanting to experiment just get started without having to deal with commercial stuff. And, and of course, commercially supported open source. Uh, uh, and, and the whole deployment flexibility, right? So uh, we, we certainly see the, in, in some finite number of years, uh, computing will become more like electricity. We, nobody will generate it for themselves. You just get it from somebody else, right? So cloud is going to become more and more, and you heard from TFL, they're basically running everything on Amazon. Uh, and so forth, right? So there's a lot of things that, that are coming along like that. So we also believe that, and, and that's why we're offering software as a service in various clouds. And our intent is to offer the same capability in multiple clouds. Uh, so right now it's only running on Amazon, but our plan is to offer the same set of capabilities on Amazon, on Microsoft, as well as Google, uh, at least initially those three. And to say, look, that's an advantage that we can offer. So you're not tied into one particular platform provider. Uh, cloud is like the infinite lock-in. If you ever had lock-in, this is far worse than anything else because not only can't you move your code because they're not standards, all the data's there. And you know, there are all these pictures of if you really want to move data, you need to take a truck and move the data from that location to another because that's what's going to happen. If you start recording everything and you put everything into an AWS data center, you, you know, this is like, like Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. <laughs> All right, so uh, the way we work with you guys, so we can help with designing strategy, developing a, a roadmap, POC, uh, deploy and scale out products, projects. But remember, we are a software company. Our primary interest is in seeing you happily in production, getting lots of traffic, needing more and more servers to run the production traffic. That's our objective. So this is all helping you get there as quickly as we can help you get there. Uh, so the, the, so yeah, so we have all kinds of things you can get from us, I'm sure. Yeah, happy to tell you more about it. We also, because we don't focus on the delivery part, that we're not a services company, we do have a bunch of partners that help customers get more people in to deliver. Because that's not our, 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 our intent. We are a 500-person company. You know, I, I expect we will grow to about 1,000 in the next five years, but not 5,000, right? And we expect to be way more than double our size with those numbers. Right? So, so in a services company, you double the number of people, you get double the number of revenue, roughly. That's not WC2, we're a software company. So, so we need to work, we, we have a lot of partners to help customers because of that. All right, so that's it. So we have a open platform for agile digital transmission. There was agile was pushed a lot earlier. We ourselves uh, follow an agile approach. We don't follow Scrum, and I, I heard the comment about you're either doing it properly or you're not doing it, so we're kind of not doing it that way. We have our own sort of wacky way of doing, doing things. Uh, but very, very committed to this kind of iterative, interactive approaches for solving problems, whatever the problem it is. Don't try to guess the end game. We are not that smart. We try to guess something that is a little bit further ahead, get there, and then adjust and iterate. Okay?
And I have one more slide that I just want to show you before we wrap up. But they've kicked me out already. Oh, that's right. So we have our conference coming up in November uh, here in London. Uh, so I just wanted to just point it out. Keep an eye on it. I think the registrations are going live in a uh, couple of weeks. Next week. Next week, OK. Uh, and uh, again, it's focused very heavily on digital transformation. There's also going to be a lot of stuff about Ballerina in there. Uh, that's in November, so we'll, it'll be, it better be all done and dusted and, and beyond by then. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, very nice to see you guys here. We appreciate you taking time. And there's some tea and stuff waiting, uh, so please feel free to enjoy that. And, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take it now, or we can just chat. Yes, please. Offerings. Where are they geography located? Uh, so they're running on AWS cloud, geographically running on multiple AWS deployments. There's a European one, there's one in Asia, one, two in the US. Uh, so API cloud is the one that's most geographically distributed right now. But our intent is to absolutely so we recognize the local aspects of that. So. What's the migration path across from WSO2 ESB? Absolutely. So we are working on a tool to take the Synapse uh, configuration stuff and generate Ballerina code. That will, there will be a first version of that released as well this summer, which will take a, a, uh, a certain level of Synapse stuff into Ballerina. There are some things, a lot of the usage of the ESB right now involves writing Java mediators, if you're familiar with the ESB. So if you've written a Java mediator, we can't translate that. Uh, so, if it's uh, fully within the Synapse world, we can we believe we can translate a big chunk of it because there's a, the simple flow of it is straight single uh, uh, single worker. Uh, after that, we'll we'll have to help you basically migrate. There's just no way around it. Okay. Thank you.